So um, we're back here on Thursday again for Think and Link. Uh, Think and Link Pants Optional specifically. Um, we put this on every week uh, as a way to provide something interesting, engaging, thoughtful um, uh, for our community of friends and family and, and anybody who happens to know us close enough. We are, um, we are a design firm here in Minneapolis or built on a design platform, essentially. We have research and design. And, um, one of the things we do is we um, help sell through for um, brands by uh, doing research in the aisle, unique form of research in the aisle, and then bringing that research into the packaging and messaging to help sell through um, brands and products. And the great thing about the stories we've got today that we're going to show you, these are two brands that have done quite well during this pandemic. Uh, before I go there, I want to I note something because Thursday is my new favorite day. I don't know if it's for you, but um, for me, doing these has been truly inspirational. It's just, it's amazing how I feel after coming out of this. It used to be that Monday was my favorite day um, of the week, and that's somewhat strange to people, I know, because um, if you're an entrepreneur, you would get it. Um, Monday is like the start of the week. It's a, it's a week of opportunity on a Monday, and, uh, but now it's Thursday. It's just, it's just a great day. So um, without that, uh, the other things, we like to see faces. So if you want to um, turn your video on, we welcome that, um, but sound off. Questions go in the chat. We also have over there our, our sponsor held over from last week. We want to give them another little boost um, because they gave us uh, Kelly and I free cookies. Um, that's all you have to do to sponsor this is <laughs> um, and in capsule just in case your mind wanders or you, and you want to browse something capsule.us is over there in the chat as well as um, Kara's book um, is over there or a, a link to Kara's book on Amazon so you can pre-order that um, which pre-orders are really good we like that as authors so um, that's my preamble I'm going to hand it over to Kara and Ryan to give a little background on, on themselves. Uh, we can start with Ryan um, and uh, I'd love to hear some of the, how you got to where you are and, and, um, and then we'll go into questions after that, after Kara's introduction. Okay. Sure, so hi, I'm Ryan Waymeyer. Um, I'm the Senior Vice President over Merchandising and Brand Partnerships at FabFitFun and I've been here for um, almost a year and a half. Uh, before that, I spent four years at Amazon, um, two years leading women's branded apparel, and then two years launching private brands in the apparel space, um, active in women's. And before that, spent 10 years in Minneapolis, so I was at Target, um, bought, buying, planning, um, mostly in apparel and homes. For my last years as the director over all of women's fashion brands and the design collaborations. And before that was in made apartment stores um, for a few years, which is where I sort of um, learned retail. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Um, I think um, one of the questions that they had sent before was just sort of, you know, how did those companies prepare me for FabFitFun? And I think, I think what I really realized is, you know, in department stores, you know, it seems like ages ago and obviously not doing as well in today's day and age, but May Company was really great about training and really teaching you sort of the basics of retail math, about merchandising. And so it really was a great place to get a foundation with so much training, working with strong leaders that had been in the business for so long. Um, and Target was definitely where I sort of learned my uh, people development skills. Um, Target is a phenomenal culture that's why I was there for 10 years. I don't actually love the cold weather. So 10 winters was uh, the price I paid for working at such an amazing company with such an amazing culture. And I think really what I learned there is that, um, so when you become a leader of people, you get a book that's called Feedback as a Gift. I don't know if they actually still do that. Um, and it seems really cheesy, but I think feedback is really what makes uh, Target so successful. You know, we have weekly one-on-ones with our managers, with all of our direct reports. I have monthlies with my indirect reports and really spent so much time on feedback about really what were their strengths and what projects could we do to really showcase their strengths and continue to build on those. What are the opportunities that could be assembly blocks and making sure that we were speaking through that and developing them there. Um, and then most importantly, like always asking for feedback for myself and how I could be a better leader 
or how I could remove roadblocks, what, what they needed from me so that they could be the most successful. Um, and then I think also a highly collaborative environment. So really learned how to influence without authority. Um, Target was, they really wanted everyone to be on the same page. So we spent a lot of time collaborating um, and sometimes over collaborating. And so definitely learned the importance of a racy or a rapid so that we could collaborate, but yet make a decision to move forward. And then I think finally, what I really learned at um, Target was how to our, treat our brands like partners. And so that's what, I, what really differentiates Target from a lot of retailers is that we would look at the year together. We would build out the year together. And we didn't want to suck all of the margin out of the room because we needed those vendors and brands to be there in the long term so that we could continue to grow the business. And so we really looked for win, win, win. You know, what was best for our guests, what was best for Target, and what was best for our vendor, um, which has been really key to how we approach brands um, at Fabfit Fund. And at Amazon, definitely culturally very different. Um, not the greatest fit for me, but learned so much about innovation and just how to sort of every little team is a startup within a giant company. And it's actually incredibly scrappy. What's shocking is that our reporting systems were actually horrible at Amazon. Anything internal facing, um, you sort of had to pull your own data and put together your own pivot tables um, because they spent all of the money on the customer and everything started with the customer and worked backwards, um, but really learned how to be innovative. And I think most importantly, how to like looking at failure is a good thing. And what we said, fail fast. So when we launched private brands, we started with 10 brands and uh or on the 10 brands that i developed knowing that not all 10 of those would go go forward and i think today there are three of those brands that we really built into power brands and really doubled down on and the other seven when we saw that they're they, they didn't have the strength that they needed to uh work we just you know closed those down liquidated the inventory and moved on so i think the ability to really um have a two-way door um test a lot of things, double down on what works and just get rid of what doesn't um, is something that I've really been able to also use at that bit fun. Great, Ryan. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Kara, you have a lot of history and you're the first person on our show that has a Wikipedia, I think, and oh, dedicated wow. to you. <laughs> and did you know that, Kara? Did you know you had a Wikipedia? Did you have a <laughs> I did know that. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I don't, I don't think I have my picture on there yet, though. I haven't quite figured out how to actually make that happen quite yet. So if you know, or if anybody knows out there, just shoot me an email. But uh, yeah, so I'm Kara Golden. I'm the founder and CEO of Hint. Uh, this is our, our product um, that most people know, although we also have uh, dove into the sunscreen industry as well as some other other personal care products and um, hopefully I won't start coughing. I have terrible allergies going on right now. Um, but uh, basically I, I started Hint about 15 years ago when I realized that I wasn't as healthy as I wanted to be. And I have, I have four kids. I had, uh, was actually pregnant with my fourth child when I had um, when I had this idea for starting Hint, um, so I always tell people, like, there's never a great time. I had four kids under the age of six running around my house and, and decided, you know, it'd be really great to actually get this product into Whole Foods. And, and uh, fast forward 15 years, we're the largest flavored water company in the U.S. today. We're, um, we do not have any... Uh, relationship with Coke or Pepsi. Um, we're really, you know, we're private. We've, um, we've been able to grow it sort of in our own way um, and on our own time as this consumer really has started to catch up to where we've, um, where I was at when I decided to start this company. And uh, probably the most unique thing about our company, in addition to um, having, you know, a unique product um, is that we do over 50% of our um, business online. And so I had actually ran AOL's e-commerce business prior to starting this company. Um, when I was at AOL, I was employee, I think, 70-something there. Um, so there was 
I was given this little button called shopping and, and said, go populate it. The, the running joke was that um, there, was, there was really no revenue targets. It was just kind of like, just go like talk to J. Crew and L.L. Bean and see what we can do. So it was, um, you know, a super crazy time. And seven years later, it was a billion dollars in revenue to AOL. And that's when I decided um, that it would be time to go and, and go do something new. And um, prior to that, I was actually in media, um, worked at on the magazine side and circulation um, for time, and then went on to CNN. And in addition to doing some ad sales for a period of time, I was um, actually helped start the airport channel. So when you're sitting in airports, um, then, and you see those monitors, you can thank me for the original uh, monitors there and, and JFK and Logan and trying to figure out how do we actually um, do those, those things. What I figured out, um, you know, throughout, it, it's always easier to look back in time and figure out, uh, you know, what you were ultimately supposed to be doing. I think for me, I, I consider myself an, an accidental entrepreneur. I never actually thought um, that I would go start a company um, and particularly not a beverage company or one that was really focused on health. Um, my dad had actually launched a brand inside of a large company called, um, the brand was called Healthy Choice. Um, so he launched inside of Armor Food Company and then ConAgra. Um, so uh, you mentioned my book. I, there's a lot of sort of discussion around that and when I grew up in and, and um, you know, always wondering why my dad didn't have the guts or courage to go out and, and launch a company. And, and um, you know, I talk a, a lot about, uh, about that in there and sort of how hard it is, as, as sexy as it sounds to go and start a company. It's, there's a lot of, you know, challenges that you, um, face along the way. And, and I think that, you know, the biggest advice I can give to any entrepreneur is like recognizing what you're doing right, recognizing what you're doing wrong. Um, and, you know, dive in to just go and try things along the way. And even if you fail, know that you'll do better next time because you're gaining all of these lessons along the way that just make you that much more prepared to, um, to really, you know, take on the take on those pieces. So, you know, talking about the direct to consumer business, um, that was at a time and hint where, you know, we were really showing up on the map. Um, we were getting nationwide distribution and places like Target as well as Kroger and Publix, et cetera. Um, but you know, when we were showing up on the map, not just for these grocery retailers, we were also showing up on the map for some of our you know, competitors, the large soda companies that had plenty of money to sort of, you know, eliminate us. And uh, we ended up going into Amazon initially um, and became one of their top products in grocery. And then, um, you know, basically Jeff Bezos owns the data. And I started realizing at that point that that data was not just, uh, it was not just sitting with Amazon, but also with Whole Foods and Target and Kroger and Publix and not me. And so, um, so that was, you know, really the epiphany that I had in saying I should go, if I really want my own data, I want to go, I need to go start my own brand. And, um, and, you know, I probably bet my job on, on that with my board, but it was, um, it was a great risk. And, you know, like I said today, especially coming hopefully out of this pandemic, um, it's, uh, you know, it, it really, I mean, our business has tripled, um, just our e-commerce business has tripled just through um, this time. So it's, it's definitely something that everybody in the company and investors are pretty happy that we, you know, Put our stakes in the ground at, around that but having said that we also still really believe in retail and i think it really just goes back to what i learned in my first job uh at time which is in in circulation which is that the if you really believe that the consumer ultimately 
controls your destiny as a brand, then you should be offering choices everywhere. So I'm delighted when people go into a Target um, and buy our product. I'm also excited when they go onto Amazon and buy our product or Walmart or Costco or on our own direct to consumer site. But there's always a reason why they're going and, and they're doing with what they're doing. And, and so, um, so that, that really is, is the, you know, what we've, what we've seen from a strategy standpoint for this brand. And, um, you know, we really also just believe it, it really goes back to my own ethos of <clears throat> making, helping make myself healthy and my family healthier by enjoying water and water that tasted better. I mean, that is something where I look at, uh, you know, this time when people have been sitting in their house, um, maybe in the beginning they were munching on Cheetos and cupcakes and, and lots of other stuff. Um, but I think more than ever, everybody in that I know is out there today trying to make sure that they stay healthy right? It doesn't matter your gender, where you live, how much money you have. Everybody's saying, I got to stay healthy and, you know, start with clean water and, you know, and, and we provide a product that tastes better, but I'm also all for, if you really believe that water is uh, your, your water from the tap is really what you're looking for and you want to slice up fruit, that's fine with me too. Um, so, you know, that's really the, the message that we're really trying to get out for people every day. That's great. Right. Right. Yeah, Thanks. everyone wants to avoid the COVID-15 for sure. That's, <laughs> yeah. It's not good, right? Kelly, do you want to start with our questions? I would love to. And uh, thank you both for joining us today. Very excited to have you. Um, Kara, Ryan, I know we had a, a pre-conversation um, uh, leading into today's session. Um, around supply chain. And the question I have for both of you, obviously you had tremendous success in the digital platform and, and this was pre-pandemic and we're obviously seeing retailers now making that shift, being forced to think digitally, right? Brick and mortar, how do we now through omni-channel approach? I'm curious with supply chain in terms of sourcing, in your case, care ingredients, and Ryan, in your say, sourcing, sourcing brands for your, your, your box, your subscription services, what changes have you seen or have you had to make um, uh, or are you planning to make um, because of this pandemic? And um, anything that you're seeing with other brands and other companies that um, uh, will actually be a requirement as we as we um, navigate this new way of working and the supply chain where we're sourcing a um, variety of uh, services and ingredients. Thoughts on that, just in terms of changes you've made? Ryan, you want to start? Yeah, I can go ahead and start. Yeah. So um, honestly, we when we started seeing the issues in China with COVID, we wanted to make sure that we were getting ahead of the curve as quickly as possible. So we only have one warehouse. So everything for, from our subscription box, as well as all of our e-commerce flash sales comes out of one warehouse in Chino. And so what we did is started doing a lot of research, started doing a lot of drills. What would it look like if people were six feet away? What would it look like if they were wearing masks? And we started it quickly investing and realized there was no amount of investment we could make in our warehouse because without a warehouse, we literally don't have a business. If I can't send you a subscription box or any products, then um, I literally can't make any money. And so we invested in all of the cleaning equipment and the masks and the gloves and, and a world in the world supply of hand sanitizer and really started operating from day one as if uh, we were in the pandemic. Um, and luckily with all of that preparation, got all of the team members ready to operate in that world. And now, as you know, California is incredibly strict and um, we are able to, we have maintained our um, productivity even actually, and, and similar to Hint, our business has increased 
quite dramatically due to COVID and people being at home. And we've been able to keep up with that demand um, because we were able to be proactive and put all of those things in place to the warehouse. And I think um, what we also did is just had tremendous communication with all of our brands and vendors um, on making sure that they were going to be able to get their products to us. Obviously, mm -hmm. we've had some success with, with a lot of them and other places where we've had to make pretty dramatic changes pretty quickly. So because we have so many relationships, we spent a lot of time chasing in the business and we have added a lot of flexibility into our model. Um, one of those things is we have a printed magazine um, that goes into each box. And we've had to really look at ways for how do we add a digital part of that so that we can change up to the minute in case a product doesn't come in and we're not able to um, get that product. Luckily, we work with pretty large brands um, on the most part, and we were able to get those products in. But we also, um, it sort of forced us to try a lot of new and of what innovative things to, to sell things. So we created a program called Boost My Box, where there was no way that we could actually get enough hand sanitizer and masks for everyone in the box. And so we have a, a program where you could spend an additional $10 and then get the masks and the hand sanitizer added to your box. So just, it actually created innovative ways for us to approach the business um, in, that, in those terms. But I would just say, um, the amount of safety and investment in the warehouse is something that we're going to continue to do. We actually have had some inspections from the, the government in California, and they have been really impressed with us going above and beyond. And that has been 100% critical to our success is really investing in those frontline workers and keeping them safe so that we can maintain the warehouse. Great answer. Thank you, Ryan. Kara, your thoughts. Uh <clears throat> so, you know, a little different than, than, you know, FabFitFun, we're, we're producing um, a product that is, because we're using fruit um, in, in the water, unlike, you know, traditional sort of bottled water companies, we're actually regulated by the FDA. And so, um, so early on, mid-March, mm -hmm. we were uh, visited um, by the FDA, you know, wanting to understand whether or not uh, the, the, you know, issue was, um, was in our food supply. And, um, and, you know, the interesting thing that we've been working on for the last couple of years in our company is actually trying to automate as much as possible and actually remove people um, from the room. So, um, our chief operating officer, who happens to be my husband, actually has been a little bit anal about this to the point where, you know, we've been like, okay, we're down to one person, like how many less can we have? Um, and, uh, you know, the answer was really zero. And, and so we had prior, obviously didn't have any ideas that COVID would hit, but you know, we today produce our product and fill the actual, you know, product into the bottle with no people in the room. And so I, I think that, you know, what, what we've learned um, that meant much of our food supply is not really there yet, um, and certainly not uh, beverage companies, is that, you know, automation is, is really critical. And especially during times like this, where you know, you have those extra people in the room um, because when they walked in and they saw, you know, there's no people in the room. Like, it's just, I mean, what could go wrong? And um, so they, you know, quickly ran out the door as compared to other people in the food industry that, you know, they had the FDA sitting there for a month, you know, trying mm -hmm. to see if there was anything there. Um, and, you know, companies like Amazon, just as an example, I mean, if you go into um, their, you know, picking and packing, it's very automated as well. And so I feel like, um, you know, there's a lot of lessons learned from smaller companies like a Hint or an Amazon that we should all be looking at how can we just get better um, as, as a whole, whether you're a food company or not. Um, and, you know, the second piece is that we produce everything in the, in the U.S. And again, like, you know, the, primarily we're doing that out of kind of ease for us. We were, we've been growing 
particular, particularly over the last few years, um, you know, over 50% year over year growth. And so we, you know, thought about, do we go into some other countries who were reaching out to us? And, you know, we really thought about it from a sustainability standpoint, like shipping water or bottles or fruit extracts overseas. Like we just didn't really think that that was kind of what we wanted to do, but also language barriers and, and other issues um, that we just thought, I don't know, let's just, even if it's a little more money to do everything locally, let's do it. So we have eight plants throughout the US um, that are producing our product. And, uh, and, and, you know, during this time, the thing that I've heard from so many companies in lots of different industries is that, you know, they've been even a component of their product is actually coming from Asia or Italy or, you know, some other place which screws up your entire product. And so, um, so I think, you know, if you don't already today have a way to 100% produce your product in the US, um, that would be a top thing that I would be putting on the list. I think, you know, also for people who are out raising money, I mean, I think every VC will be, you know, asking that question as well. Um, you know, what happens? Um, because I think a lot of the reason why a lot of numbers were down were, you know, obviously depending on the category and whether you're an essential product or not. Um, but I really, really believe that actually having the ability to do everything in the US and even, you know, since we had the, our pre-meeting for, for this meeting, I mean, you know, now if your production is outside the U.S., like, can you even go outside the U.S. to go visit your factories? And, you know, that's a whole other piece of this, too, that it's like, what will happen? So I think it's, it's time to sort of look, you know, at all the warts and all and your, you know, how you guys handled um, the, the last few months and, and see like, how can we just be better? And, um, and that's, you know, certainly what we're doing inside of our company. Although I think we did a lot of things right, but I think it's, it's definitely for the future. If you haven't already done it, you know, you should really look at God, if we would have had, you know, all of our stuff in the U S if we would have tried to figure out how to automate better, um, you know, and, one other, one last thing that I think a lot of our um, our business customers really we saw with um, the electronic um, you know ordering from the cash registers, um, it just it was overwhelmed and it broke down. So you know, as an example, Target um, was one where you know we have a huge relationship with Target. Um, but there were a lot of stores in the Bay Area where our shelves were empty. And that, you know, on the one hand, you're like, oh, great. You know, everyone's hoarding Hint. And then after a while, you're like, oh, shoot. Like, no one's going to be able to buy Hint. And nobody really had, uh, it, nobody really had an answer for that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that's another piece of, you know, for the larger companies that are really um, focused on, you know, making sure that their, uh, that, that their shelves are stocked, um, that I think it's, it's trying to figure out if this happens again. We actually um, were a little ahead of it and called all of our partners and, and said, hey, you know, we, don't, we see that there's a problem here. Can we send truckloads in? And, you know, Target, as an example, said, yes, please. Like, we don't know what's going on. Um, but there were a lot of, you know, competitors to us or people in other categories who were like, you know, they didn't do that. And they lost space along the way. So I think it's just, it's really trying to figure out, you know, how, how could we have been, how could we have been better? How could we have, you know, really done what other people had did that seemed, you know, to be more successful? Um, you know, I think that that's such a, that's such a key, key piece. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's great. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, a, a, uh, yeah, well, an interesting perspective, especially going through this. 
um, a, a small shift of gears, Ryan, we talked really early in this pandemic um, and you um, and FabFitFun kept promoting, advertising, spending on marketing from what I could tell, um, at least at the time you were definitely all in um, and you had a perspective then and it seemed like you were getting more reach if I remember correctly in our conversation, but have you seen other things that have come out of that, that you've, because you've kept doing it, because you've continued through and promoted the FabFitFun brand, um, any other things that have developed since we talked, I guess? Yeah, I mean, I think what we saw is that um, having a value proposition, you know, we've always believed that having the best value proposition and differentiators made us a successful business and what we what we wanted to believe was recession proof. However, we, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, it looked like we'd be heading into a recession. We're now in one. And so we were uh, somewhat hesitant, but obviously always using data. And we expected that we would see that our retention numbers to the subscription would go down. We, accept, we expected that it would be harder to acquire customers. What we actually have found is that it's been quite the opposite. Our retention numbers are at, you know, up against record highs um, because people are seeing so much value of the product and our acquisition is coming in higher than our uh, trend and is coming in at a lower cost because so many people exited the um, marketing space. And so we're able to get more reach for fewer dollars, which has brought on more members and it's created, I, I mean, what's, in, what's crazy is it's been probably the busiest three months um, since I've been there and that we've been just chasing business like crazy. One, because we just need more of what we were already selling and two, because obviously we need to sell different things in some cases. But I think because we offer a tremendous value, so the subscription is $50 for a box with $200 of value across all categories, full size, and then access to our flash sales where we truly offer the best prices in the market. And we already were in the categories of fitness, wellness, um, and self-care. Um, and what we've seen is obviously those have increased dramatically. Um, and we were able to chase into things like hand sanitizer and masks. Um, I would have never guessed in a million years that face masks are literally my number one fashion category now because <laughs> you're able to chase into cute masks and you know more functional masks and people are absolutely loving them. So what our assortment looks like is different. And what's funny is our name is FabFitFun. Um, so fits in the name. So we've always had to have fitness as part of our subscription box as well as our sales because it is part of who we are and looking at, um, at the woman um, as a whole person, looking at the member as a whole person. And what we have found is that now finally, fitness we can't get enough of. I can't chase into enough product. You can't get it, at, it's selling out. And so fitness has become a huge part of our business, um, which has been a positive change. And what we did is we have, um, uh, FabFitFun TV, which is um, videos that are accessible to the members behind the paywall. And there's a lot of fitness content. And so we just opened that up to people outside of the membership um, to share with them, um, you know, just to, to, to bring some joy to allow people to do fitness at home, um, which was great in just getting our brand out there, but also a great service to our members. And then the other thing that we have that's our differentiator is we have our community. And what we've seen is that um, our community members are really spending a lot of time talking to each other about how they're coping with COVID with COVID. If they've lost a loved one, they they talk, you know, they form groups and they they send each other gifts. They compare, you know, the different face masks, all the people, they can't go to their spas anymore. So they're like, how are you, you know, keep it getting your what are you using for your crow's feet? What beauty products are you using? What skincare? And so it's really created this sense of community um, and has made that even more of a value prop. So I think um, what COVID has done is it allowed um, our members to really see um, our value prop in an even bigger way. They have more time, so they're spending more time with all of the different aspects of the membership. And so it's really helped us to double down and continue to grow the business um, during what is otherwise a tough time. And I think most importantly is we really tell brand stories. We really celebrate brands and brand founders and the products and what's great about them. And we just bring joy. And I think that's what people really want during this time is a moment of joy. So getting a box full of surprise and delight items at great value is something that um, has continued to resonate. That's great. Yeah, definitely joy in a box. 
Yeah. Kelly, you want to jump in with the next? I question? do. And actually, Kara, I'm going to put you on the spot because I saw you commented on this. Um, this Coca Cola, obviously eliminating Adwala from their portfolio of brands. You called that an epic fail. I think there are a lot of people that share that opinion. And I'm curious if you could add some perspective on your thought around that. And then I have a question as a follow up. Um, yeah, it's just because that. Ryan uh, showed that I have to show our hand <laughs> maps there. there we go. <laughs> So, well done. It. And we have hand sanitizers coming in the next two weeks. So that's that's been a you know another piece of our uh, success, uh, just really following and and sort of helping the consumer stay as healthy as possible um, in the midst of it. But yeah, I mean you know Adwala, uh, it's I'm old enough to sort of remember when Adwala and actually my husband um, was one of the lawyers on. Adwala mm -hmm. when um, when they were a private company and um, for those of you who remember Adwala you know prior to 2001 they uh, had this e issue with E. coli they didn't pasteurize their product and it ended up that you know the people who were juicing the product didn't realize that they couldn't pick up the apples off the ground and so there was bacteria on the ground that ended up going you know into the apple juice and and um, unfortunately three children i believe it was three children died um, from it so it was a it was a very serious you know issue and and frankly, we you know learned a lot about production just from him him being one of the lawyers um, on that on that whole issue. But you know when Coca Cola came in and acquired uh, acquired Adwala, I think you know that when I look at that company and and kind of what that juice is today, and I look at other companies, whether it's, you know, press juicery or some of the other fresh, there definitely is a, um, a desire for juice um, that's out there. But I think the demand of the consumer is that it has to be fresh, right? And I think that, you know, you taste, um, you know, some of these juices that are out there and not just picking on Coke. I mean, there's others that you know, Pepsi owns and, you know, other zone out there that are just really um, not, not real juice. And they've been butchered with, you know, a lot of other stuff and, and cut with, you know, whether it's water or other ingredients in it. And um, so anyway, I feel like, you know, it's just gotten worse and worse every single year. Um, and, you know, they own all of the coolers in all of these stores um, and have prime real estate. And, you know, and so, like, why didn't they get it, right? Why didn't, who, who missed, you know, seeing that? Because, you know, it, I really believe that great products, in addition to sort of marketing and letting consumers know what's out there, it's, you know, it's taste, especially in a food or beverage, but then it's also real estate and they had the real estate. And so, you know, it's just, it, it, it's a huge miss. Um, and, you know, it's when I think about that company as well, in particular, I look at, you know, some of the other acquisitions that have been made, this one not actually in, in the food and beverage space, but um, in, uh, in um, the shaving space, like uh, Unilever acquired Dollar Shave a few years ago. And it's my understanding that they've kind of left it alone. And obviously they still have the, the data, but I remember when that whole deal went down, everybody was like, oh my God, Unilever's getting into the shaving space. And, you know, that wasn't what they were doing because they really like, you know, left it alone. And I, and I think that, you know, we've seen so many acquisitions over time that really the, the large guys didn't leave it alone. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see what happens with Lululemon and Mirror and, you know, and uh, like, you know, do you leave it alone? Right. Um, do you, you know, really look at it as an acquisition just for data or do you come in and try and, 
you know, wave your wand on it and, you know, and, and mess it up. Because I think that, you know, the disruptors that are really coming in and, and, you know, creating these things, it often takes longer, right, for them to, to kind of do things and get scale. And I think it's just something that whether it's a large company or a private equity firm tends to come in and just kind of, you know, they come in too early and they try and control it. And so, um, so anyway, that was, that was really, you know, what I see on the Edwalla side. And, you know, I think it's, I think it's sad. Um, it'll be interesting to see, you know, what happens and, and maybe it comes back. I don't know, you know, over time, I, uh, it's, I, I look at so many brands along the way that, you know, not some of them not so great for you, but uh, but just brands that I think where something's happened to them and then they've come back years later. And I think you can make a comeback, but someone's really got to pay attention to the quality of that. But what's really terrible is a lot of people lost jobs. I mean, mm -hmm. that was a pretty significant sales force and dismantling that, um, you know, and I, I don't know. I don't know what happened there, but. Interesting. No, it's an interesting perspective. And yes, you mentioned the Lululemon and Mirror, and I guess this is a tangential question to the discussion around um, big brands trying to bolster their portfolio with up and coming trending brands. Maybe not the case with Lululemon and, and Mirror, but I'm curious both of your perspectives on um, the importance of brand as it's perceived by from a consumer facing perspective versus a B2B, so an, an, an M&A type of situation. So where you see differences in um, how a brand can uh, tell their story or how they show up visually consumer facing versus B2B, if you have any thoughts on that, or just the value of the quantifiable, quantifiable value of brand in general and how important that is, because it's obviously both important to FabFitFun hint in terms of how you present the brand and staying true to your story. Any thoughts on that? I, I think that the value of a brand is, um, is still incredibly strong. And, you know, and, and even when you've got a private label um, brand that without actually having a brand where the consumer can sort of like think quickly, um, you know, there was thinking, I would say probably the early 2000s where why do we need brands? Let's just go create private labels all over the place. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think consumers, you know, I think brands are also, I mean, this is probably a deeper conversation and you guys probably know a lot about this as well, but it's not just about, um, it's not just about the taste. It's also about the feel. It's about, you know, the, the visual, you know, everything about it. Um, and, and I think it, you know, what we've seen over the last few years too, is it's also, especially founder driven brands. And if you've got a purpose for starting a company, I mean, you, if, if you have the ability to sort of be out there and, and even if you don't have the ability to be out there, I think that consumers, want to know i mean who's who's behind this brand and yeah. you know and i think that some days it it like is all good other days with you know there's a few brands right now that are out there where you know the founder is getting hit super hard right mm -hmm. and um and so i think it's it's a the consumer demands um you know sort of understanding and 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 sort of what is the what is the background on on this person, even if it has nothing to do with the actual product. Yeah. Um, I think they're sort of a, you know, influencer or you know, celebrity is sort of a weird word, but I think in some ways, you know, it's it's it can also take a brand down mm -hmm. in many ways. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Really yeah, I would say, you know, just to add on to that, I, I, for us, brand 
um, is incredibly important um, because what we do, we, we view ourselves as storytellers and we really think of ourselves at that sort of uh, place. And that's what we do for our, our members is we introduce them to great new brands and great new products. And the fact is, if a product is great or a brand is great, then there must be a great story there. And a lot of brands just don't do a good job of telling the story. And so I think that's where we've been successful is really helping the brands to tell those stories, to connect the stories, to tell people why their product is amazing and so that has that's why brands work with us they don't they work with us is because we get their story out there to a huge audience and we create uh followers of their brands and we generally will direct the traffic to back to their site if they're direct to consumer or we actually are you know working with sephora now on directing traffic to them because ultimately we are, dry, we are telling that story. We are introducing that product to someone who otherwise wouldn't know about it. And mm -hmm. when they know the story, when they know why the product is great, when they know whether it's the ingredient story or the results or whatever it is, um, we just found that it has driven tremendous results for all of the brands that we work with. And they come back to introduce new products or whatever it is. And I think the brands that tell those stories are um, the ones that we that we have more success with um, are definitely the ones that have great brand or founder stories or uh, product stories. And then also just to add, I think a newer thing for us, uh, not newer, but you know, obviously very of the moment is when you do put a lot of your brand behind your founder, it's clearer now that you should make sure that you know everything about your founder and their behavior because we're certainly seeing, you know, some brands, not, I won't call any out by name, but we have brands where we've have huge amounts of business planned for the rest of the year that we are now on pause with because mm -hmm. of sort of the situations they've got themselves into. So I think that that is something that's really important about brand is that if you're going to be based on a founder, then the founder better have a really great story and you better understand uh, the pros and the cons and, and be able to communicate that to the consumer. Great point. Yeah. yeah, great point. In a way, the founders are a celebrity it's, and it's a, the riskiest celebrity you could possibly have, right? And they get mixed up with something bad for you. Um, so, and, uh, and Ryan, I don't, I don't know that you've got this going on, but I'm, I'm still very curious. We've talked about this, about, about chocolate and uh, in the future, I'd love to see you have a chilled box or something, you know, that we can actually do more fresh stuff. That would be really cool. That's just, you know, my side view on it. Um, Cause there's gotta be some option to deliver beyond, you know, the current situation. But I'm curious what uh, other things you're seeing that are trending, um, or that you're looking out over the horizon of this um what's going to be more interesting once we get past face masks face masks and and sanitizer what are the things um other cultural changes you're seeing other fascinating components of, of business yeah so i mean obviously you know we're always looking out what we can do and what we've built is you know sort of similar to Amazon on a much, much, much smaller scale is that, you know, Amazon got out there with a fulfillment network and they got it to a point where no one could really catch up. And so they can now do two hour delivery, one day delivery, whatever it is. And, and really people can't catch up. Luckily, brick and mortar stores are, are now realizing that their stores can be warehouses. And so they can, they can compete in that way. But that really is how Amazon got out there and ahead. And what we've done is we've built a warehouse that allows us to have the most customizable subscription box out there. So we are at about, I think one box has about 800,000 variations and um, cause box, which is a similar box to ours. Um, but you know, I think they probably have like 30 variations. So our ability to be customizable and personalized is really what we're doubling down on and what we believe in. Um, and then, but we do believe that obviously, and we know that our members want more from us. And so we provide those through flash sales and we, and what we're doing is creating more curated flash sales. We just had one that was called World of Kate because Kate Somerville and Kate Spade are two of the member favorite brands. And so it was a sale of only those products. And so telling, once again, going back to the storytelling, and we certainly believe that there are boxes in the future that we're exploring, lifestyle boxes, whether it's a wedding or a new baby or things like that. And then um, just looking at other subscription, like we, we certainly, 
have seen success in subscription. We still believe in subscription. We believe there are other subscriptions. Um, we had a sale, another theme sale called Wine and Dine. And literally in the community, the biggest uh, comment was, where's the wine? Our, we know our members want wine, but we also know it's a highly difficult business. So, you know, there are things that on the long term we hope to get into um, and definitely believe that our members will trust us for. Um, they're just, you know, what, what we're trying to do is stay focused on the core business. We feel like we have so much growth there and then, you know, testing into some of the other ideas, potentially finding third party partners that, that are already experts in the space. Um, but we definitely believe that, you know, sort of the sky's the limit in sort of the different types of subscriptions that we could offer in the future. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to probably run into some state law issues with transporting alcohol across borders. It does pop up a bit. Yeah. Um, Kara, I'm, I'm very curious about, and this is um, um, the thing that I wanted to ask at the beginning, or have you talk about, um, I always, I look at every person that I interact with, either they're an entrepreneur or they're a future entrepreneur, um, that they will get out there and try this at some point in time to be out there and have a, start something on their own. Um, is there something that you want to share with them, something um, they could, uh, to incentivize them to take the leap, to go out there, and then um, what would you do? Would you change anything if you started over the beginning um, uh, in being an entrepreneur? Yeah, so I, I never encourage people to be entrepreneurs because I think like you just, I, I mean, there's way easier ways to make money, right? And so, you know, when I hear people say like, oh, you know, I saw like so-and-so sell their company for you know, whatever. I mean, the number of startups that actually go out of business are much bigger than uh, certainly in the beverage industry, but uh, but in every category. And and so, you know, I think I think that the best entrepreneurs that I found are ones that actually like see this problem right in front of them um, that maybe their friends don't actually think like it's an, it's a problem, but they think like, it's kind of interesting. So initially, you know, I would go to dinner parties and I mean, my backstory of, I, I was a diet Coke addict and I really thought that diet Coke was, I didn't think that there was anything wrong with diet Coke. I was like drinking away and, you know, had gained a bunch of weight over the course of four pregnancies. And, um, and basically had tried everything. And I was a competitive athlete. I was a gymnast growing up. So I knew how to train. I was very disciplined. And, um, but what I realized is that it wasn't just about working out and food. It was also about what I was drinking. And again, I was at that time, it wasn't zero calorie. It was 10 calories, but my metabolism was a mess. And I did, no one was telling me this. And then when I stopped drinking Diet Coke in two and a half weeks, I lost 24 pounds in two and a half weeks. I mean, it was crazy. Wow. And then in six months, I, um, you know, I lost over 55 pounds. And I actually went through this whole process of wondering if I was sick and, you know, why am I losing so much weight? And then I really started to dig in, in and was curious about how my body was like reacting to these diet sweeteners. And so, um, so that's the reason why, you know, I started really, really drinking water to begin with is that I knew I, I was thirsty and I, you know, didn't used to drink water. And then I questioned like, well, why don't I drink water? I think I'm supposed to be drinking water. And then I convinced myself that Diet Coke had some water in there somewhere. And that's why I was drinking it for so many years, but it was really about taste. And so that's when, you know, I, I was really doing my own due diligence on, you know, still not even thinking about starting a company, but just curious as a consumer, why this product wasn't on the shelf. And then, you know, that was really when I just decided, even if no one buys it, I'm gonna go, start this company. I can now look at entrepreneurs who, you know, almost in the first half hour of meeting, meeting them, they'll tell me like how they're going to sell this company in two years. And, you know, the market is this big and this big. It's like, you should have that information, but that's not the reason you're starting a company, right? Like you've got, you're, 
you look at this like white space for, for starting a company. And, you know, I have, I think there's also two different types of entrepreneurs. One that wants to do better than one that they see out there and they want to sort of go in and fill the category. I happen to be one that is even crazier that looks for the white space and, you know, and, and whether it's sunscreen or deodorant and really goes in and, and tries to figure out and water and, and figures out kind of what's missing there, which is even harder. I mean, we not only started a product, but we also started an entirely new category, which is absolutely insane. Um, you know, the unsweetened flavored water, there was, you know, nobody doing what we were doing when we started. So, so again, I think the, the biggest advice is you know, you got to be doing it because you feel like you're solving, you know, some kind of problem and, and, um, and, you know, that's, as I mentioned, my dad, I, I still viewed my dad as an entrepreneur that even though he was working in a large company, but he also felt like he had five kids that he wanted to make sure he could put food on the table. And so I can never tell people to just go be an entrepreneur. Um, and go do it and you know not sort of knowing that the shoes that they're living in you know a need to be you know filled or you know what what else is going on in their life so um, I, I interviewed uh, Greg Renfrew from Beauty Counter for my podcast uh, a few weeks ago and you know she's said the same thing like it's you know it always takes longer right, then, then you think it's going to take. So it's not sort of a, you know, quick flip for most people either. You have to really go and build the brand and, and do it right. So yeah. I think that's, that's the biggest, that's the biggest thing. And, and also, you know, why not go work and support an entrepreneur, especially if you're coming from a large, you know, company, go and if you're really not sure about your idea, um, I mean, my favorite, one of my favorite books is Adam Grant's Originals book. And if you guys haven't read it, I mean, it's, it's awesome. And it really talks about, um, you know, the crazy founders that are out there. And it's no longer the case where you've got to quit your job and go start a company. You can sort of try and think about it on weekends and do some other stuff to try and, you uh, you know, figure out if the, if the business is real and otherwise just go, you know, work for um, a company that is, you know, doing well. Go work for Ryan. He seems like he's got great training over there and, and you know, is a good manager and, and trying to figure out lots of stuff. And, and, um, and then you can really see how hard it is to be inside of a company. I also, one other quick thing, I think like the other thing that I see that a lot of people don't really understand too is there's different types of companies um, that you can go view as well. I mean, you can go view a, like a, people will come to me and they'll say, oh, I tried the startup thing and, and that wasn't for me. And I'm like, so like, how big was the startup? And they're like, oh, it had five people. Five people startup versus a 50 person startup is a very different situation. And, you know, a well-funded startup or a decently funded startup is a very different. So I always tell people there's, you know, there's a lot of different stages too. And knowing sort of what you ultimately want to do um, or where you can really add the most value at is really super important. That's a great answer. That's great. I'm inspired. Thank you, Karen. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, I, the only other, I've got one other thought that I, I wanted to add earlier, we've been picking on Coca Cola a little bit, um, and not that I'm going to pile on there a little bit, but I got a wonderful quote from a guy named um, Brian Matt the other day, and um, innovation is hard, it's really hard, especially for big companies, it can be very hard, so to hear innovation stories, it's important to recognize those, and, um, and he said something like, I mean, even Coca-Cola couldn't actually put water in a bottle, they had to actually buy Dasani. Right, they couldn't, which is a fascinating perspective on that, right? Uh, right, you know, adjacent to your category, Kara, the, the fact that it is, it's really hard to do what you're doing. And the entrepreneurship thing is definitely also on that list of, it is, you're doing the business and the, and the innovation at the same time. Um, uh, do you have any other questions, Kelly? 
No, I, I actually I have it maybe just a to end on a, a positive, optimistic view of, of our future. I'm curious for both Ryan and Kara what you're seeing on the horizon, some positive things that you're seeing or outcomes of this challenging climate we've had for the last three, four months, five months. Um, what are you seeing, either from a br brands that are that are making changes that are um, obviously a positive movement? Um, just any anything that you're seeing out in the world. Yeah, I can yeah. go quickly. I know we're yeah, running out of time, but I would say, you know, we've always been about telling <laughs> brand stories and founder stories and product stories. And we've always thought that businesses owned by people of color and by women and by LGBTQ plus community were important. And so what we've done is we never thought to quantify it. So what we're doing is really quantifying where we are and making sure that we are amplifying that even more, making it a bigger part of our business. And I think, um, and obviously we've had a lot more uh, conversations internally about diversity and inclusion, and we are really, do, we're doing listening sessions and, you know, really hearing from all levels of the company, what we can do better as a uh, diverse company and how we can be more inclusive. So I think, um, although some brands are learning the lesson the hard way, all of the companies I think really focusing on this diversity and inclusion and really ensuring um, that they're taking responsible action, although maybe painful for some of them in the short term, I think will be far better for them in the long term. Um, and will be obviously far better for us um, all. So, um, you know, I do think that although painful for some, it's, it's a really great place um, and a really great focus and um, a great way for companies to focus on positive change. Right. Sarah, anything to add? Yeah, I, I think a couple of things come to mind. First, uh, having a remote staff, even before um, shelter in place COVID, um, is what I realized is that although we were doing a lot of things internally, it was not being articulated. I mean, we're based in San Francisco, we have an office in New York, but we have people throughout the US. And so it just wasn't actually being articulated what we were doing. So I think um, it was a time for us to pause and not only talk about externally what we were doing, but also internally what we were doing mm -hmm. um, so that employees would really understand um, it as well. And, and I would say that, you know, the one other piece of this too, we've always, you know, shown up for, uh, for, you know, major um, crises in the U.S., whether it's the, the fires in, in, you know, California or, you know, the flooding in Houston or, I mean, we've, we've always been, you know, one of the first to actually show up and, you know, with truckloads of water. I mean, it's the, it's the upside of having a product that, you know, pretty much anybody, you know, can use. And for us, it's always been really important, you know, to, to get there and, and figure it out really, really fast. And then oftentimes even asking some of the other people in our, you know, food and beverage universe to show up too. And, um, and so I think for, for us, um, you know, when Black Lives Matter hit, it was something that we said, it's not always just about a physical product, it's also about money. And so, you know, we, we really wanted to use our voice to talk about police reform and also um, giving, uh, you know, a $50,000 donation to um, the, the Legal Defense Fund to really help people who might not be able to um, hire lawyers. Like that was something that we just thought is, you know, particularly in this time is, you know, on the same level in our belief as as actually keeping people hydrated um and so i think that it's um but again like i i think it was it was a time for us to really think about um you know there are these causes that i think are really important and um and it's not just about donations it's really about how can we actually just be better um but not just for the consumers also for you know, the employees. And like I said, a lot of the stuff we were already doing, um, but I think that there was, 
you know, a wake up call to us to say like, sometimes it's, you just don't know. And particularly in an environment where everybody's working remote, I think it's something that, you know, we're, we're now very aware that we just have to be better at figuring out ways to communicate it.